All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 27. As I said, we're going to finish out the chapter today. Getting a late start. Church ran a little long. We had a little few things going on here, but let's see if we can nail it down before we leave this morning. Let me read this through for you just to put you in remembrance the standard here of what we're going to be dealing with in chapter 9, starting in verse 19. And here, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like those under the law, though I am myself not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. <clears throat> So as to win those that are not having the law. To the weak I become weak, to the win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share it in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown they will not, that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man being in the air. I beat my body and I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. Let me put you back in context. We missed a week and I, I do this, so it's review time. We spent a lot of time in reviews because I want you to understand the context. This whole thing started, and what Paul's expanding on is it came from a question. And here was the question. Remember that setting? There was a structure going on there, a little bit of a tension between two groups in Corinth. And one was saying that we've got to leave behind this pagan belief, and we've got to cut ourselves off from all those old pagan practices. And they had said we will not go near the old temples, and the one thing we will never do again is eat any meat that was sacrificed to an idol. Remember that? No meat sacrificed to an idol. And as you saw, if you recall those things, this was a constant process. There was a constant set of sacrifices required, and out the back door of each temple was the place to get your butcher shop shopping done, right? The priest would keep some from himself. He would burn some or offer some in, in sacrifice to the god, but the really good stuff they would sell. And, and why, why did people flock to these places to buy it? Cheap. It was cheap. It was cheaper than any place else. No overhead, right? He got it for free. He can sell it for less than other people. Against that, the other group is going, a little more mature group, a little more theologically knowledge group, is saying, no, we don't have to avoid this stuff. And remember, they had three big reasons. Let's see if you can remember those. The three reasons. Their gods aren't real. There's nothing in that idol. It's wood, stone, metal. Who cares? What else? God never commanded us not to eat it. It's not in the scripture. God didn't say we couldn't do this. And third, the big thing, God has dropped the dietary laws. God doesn't care what you eat. It's no big deal. So you have the tension. Now, I don't know if you've ever had this situation where you're at war with somebody, you're fighting over a certain issue, and you decide, here's what we're going to do. I'll show you that I'm right. I'll ask an expert. <laughs> and that's what we do. Now, if you're going to do that, what expert do you always ask? One Good that agrees with you. you. One that's going to agree with you, right? So here we go. John and I are at war. He's saying this thing. You're just being, you understand these new rules. We have to do this. You go, no, John, you don't understand. So I pick an expert. And I pick Dave. Dave, I know. You don't know Dave so well. <laughs> And in this case, they picked Paul. Now, I want you to understand, they picked Paul because Paul was the guy that founded the church. These older Christians who know a bit more have been taught under Paul, and they know what Paul said about this stuff. And that's why. I'm not going to ask you unless I know the answer, right? I'm not going to bring this whole issue between John and I to you unless I know what you're going to say. They know what Paul's going to say. And so I ask you, who's right? Dave goes, yeah, you are, Myron. And I go, and I'm waiting for my big moment. You know what I want to do in this whole thing? More than anything else when it's all said and done? I told you so. That's what I want. So Dave goes, you're right. Idol is nothing. It's wood, stone, wood, metal. Who cares? God didn't say anything about eating food, sacrificed to idols, and there are no dietary things. And about what I'm going to turn to you to say, I told you so, you know what the next word out of his mouth is? But. But. 
that's where it gets bad. Yeah. Because he goes, no, but John has a point here. He and other Christians are struggling with this, and you should be sensitive to that. You should actually care what happens to them. And if this is something that's going to help them get out of that old paganism, you should concede that point. That is not what I wanted to hear. Because even bigger than wanting to be right was the other issue. Remember the other issue? This is going to cost me money. I wanted to be right, but more than that, I wanted to save a few bucks. So now here the problem is, my guy has turned on me. Paul has not backed them up the way they thought. So they get a little upset with Paul. And you remember the argument that comes back. But Paul, here's the thing. You're making this ruling. You don't have to live here in Corinth. You don't have to deal with the prices. And this is going to cost me money. And you can make that rule because you're moving off to Idaho or whatever. You're someplace else. You're not going to have to deal with these prices. And I am. Now, you remember the response to that? <clears throat> Paul's response? I have a right to a lot of things that I have to use. As a matter of fact, I do have to live with that because I have a right to some things that I'm not getting. Remember what his right was? Right. I have a right to get paid for the ministry. I am working full time to serve the churches, not just you, but churches everywhere. I'm doing this full time, and I don't get paid a dime. Remember, Paul worked. Now, Paul was very fortunate to have a kind of job he could take anywhere. What was Paul's job? Leatherwork. Leatherwork. <laughs> Off May 10th, leatherwork. How hard is it to go in and set up a sewing setup in those days? Pretty much Paul could arrive within an hour or two. He's in business. And some of his traveling companions didn't have that. Remember Matthew, one of the disciples, one of the original apostles, was a tax collector. How quickly can you go into a new city and find a job as a tax collector? I don't even care. Give How many money. people want you to find a new job as a tax collector? As you go to the, city? the other tax collector who's making a fortune being doesn't want the competition. So Paul has this job that he can do anywhere. And remember, Paul was so good at it that not only did he support himself, remember what he also did? Everybody he supported the whole team, the people that traveled with him. This is Paul saying. So Paul goes, you know, you're complaining about a rise in prices. I don't get anything. So I think I have some stature to tell you that there can be some sacrifice on behalf of other people. Now here Paul is going to expand this idea a little bit. <clears throat> Paul is going to, because remember, here's the starting point. The starting point is we have Christian brothers who are asking us to curtail our activity in an area these are people I know. We share the same faith. We worship together. We might be friends. I hope we still are, John, after this example. And we see these things. No. Yeah, we'll have to talk about it. I won't be speaking to the next child coming of age, will I? But anyway. Vanity. Vanity. All the time. We look at these things. We look at these things. But now Paul is going to expand it. And now he's going to say, not only that, you should be willing to sacrifice not for people you know and care about, let me tell you about another group of people that I sacrifice for in an even greater way. And this is what's going to come here in verses 19 to 27. Now, I want you to understand Paul is going to talk about this willingness to set aside your rights. Now, can you think of anything more important in our culture right now than our sense of what our rights are? <laughs> we are enamored with this, aren't we? And we're constantly expanding the list of things that we demand as our rights. That list is growing all the time. We've got a bigger and bigger list, a bigger and bigger understanding of it. And one of the things that has changed in our culture in, in, within my lifetime has been this. There was a time when we actually venerated people for having a sacrificial attitude towards others. There was a time when we saw that as admirable, that people self-sacrifice, set aside their needs, their desires for the well-being of other people. Most especially, we saw this as one of the greatest things about, I, this is a group that has long since been forgotten, they were called parents. <laughs> there used to be these two people called mom and dad who raised children. You know what they did when they raised children? They sacrificed for them. There was an attitude that this was an admirable thing to do. I say my generation changed that because in our time, the women's movement came up and said, this is holding women back. Men thought, this is great. We're going to stop sacrificing. I'm all down with that. And there came this new attitude. 
And it said this, the most important thing that you can do is to do this. Before you can love anyone else, you have to learn how to love yourself. Now, I'm sorry, having read the scripture, that has never been a problem for humanity. <laughs> that is the core of sin, is that we love ourselves to the exclusion of everyone else. And so we said this. What is important is that you may realize yourself. You need to pursue your goals, your aspirations, your, your career. And once you have done all these things, maybe we can have other people in our life. And we had the first generation that bought into this idea. And we had this whole sense of me first. I pick on the women's movement and understand. Men thought this was a brilliant idea. We always liked the idea of me first. So if you wanted to join in, great. And here we were. Mm -hmm. Now, here's something that's interesting. My generation, as I said, started this and really pushed this big. And we have the, now the first generation of women, especially, that pursued those goals to the exclusion of all else. They have turned back on marriage. There was a, a saying that was big among the women's women. A woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. Okay. You follow that? A fish, can, can a fish ride a bicycle? So they were saying, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. It's a, who cares? You're not missing anything. Well, here we are now. These women are mostly in my age category and older. that are coming into this now, and we're retiring. We're moving into retirement. And what do you think they're finding now? They've had no husbands, no children, no grandchildren. Parents have died off. The parents are gone. The career that defined them is now gone. And what do you think is the condition of people who wanted to make loving themselves the primary driving force of life? Bitter, angry, Bitter, angry and depressed. Because guess what? God actually has something here. That, that people that tend to sacrifice for other people impact people's lives and they make relationships with those people. That people that care about others actually draw people to them. That Here's the strangest thing. Children that know they were sacrificed for have a sense of gratitude. What a strange... I know, another word that's losing out in our culture. And here it is. They're finding that those things that carried us in, that as you get older, that having family and friends and people that you sacrifice for who now say, hey, I know you don't drive anymore, we'll take care of that. Tell me where you need to go. That will come in and check in on you. That if you have no place to be, we'll actually say, come live with us. We had my mother for a number of years, my wife's mother before that. Mm -hmm. Family is what you do, right? Mm -hmm. And this has shown a certain flaw, that maybe God and the idea of sacrificing the others might make sense. Yeah, Kevin. It reminds me of what Jesus said, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who loses his life will gain it. Precisely. Thank you for stealing my quote. But that's right. It, you're right. That is exactly right. It does that. It has that impact on us. It builds relationships. God actually knows what he's talking about. We impress people. We change people by an attitude of sacrifice. Now, of course, those studies are being widely published. All of you have seen these the studies I talk about, right? Because they're being covered in the news night and day, right? Um, we're doubling down uh, we just had these hearings after the overturning of Roe there was a woman who was testifying who made this comment and I thought this, this sums up the emptiness of a life perhaps more than anything else I've ever heard she said this in defending abortion she said the greatest achievement of my life was choosing an abortion now uh, when, when you sum up Decades of living, and you look at your life and say, the greatest thing I ever achieved in life was choosing to end the life of a child. And she made this comment. It was the greatest act of self-love I ever did. Okay? And it probably is. That, that much is true. It probably is the greatest act of self-love she ever did. We have this. And I, I use the example of the women's move, but hasn't that run through our entire culture? Isn't everything we're seeing, every movement we're seeing, really all about what I want for me to the exclusion of all else? Isn't that really the nature of all of these things, from the gender identity to all? It's all about me. 
young people putting off marriage later and later. Why? Because until I do what I want to do, I don't want anybody in the way. And once I've accomplished what I want to do, maybe I'll let somebody in. And of course, that really helps the relationship because once you have that attitude, there's nothing like adding a person to that. Isn't well, it? as long as he does what I says, we'll be happy. Yeah, he will. <laughs> <laughs> and we make fun of this when we look at it, but isn't it tragic what we're seeing? And what Paul is talking about here is something that is incredibly foreign to us anymore. An idea that my comfort isn't the only thing that matters. That used to be, as I said, very prevalent on us. We, most of us came from immigrant backgrounds. We know parents that came here for one select thing. I may not know the language yet. I have to come here and try to start a job. But what's going to be different? My children will have a better life. We had this sense of things. It drove us. There was a power to it. And we understood that. And there was a joy in seeing it accomplished amidst the pain of sacrifice, wasn't there? There was that joy in seeing these things accomplished. But that nobility is gone. Now here's what Paul is going to say. This attitude of sacrifice isn't just for the people we care about and that care about us. He's going to put in the context of another group. He says, that sacrifice that I'm asking you to do for your brother, as a matter of fact, you should be doing for the unsaved. Now, what was Paul's experience with the unsaved, by and large? Now, we do know there were people converted, but what happened to Paul frequently? Beaten. Beaten. Imprisoned. Imprisoned. Stoned. Stoned and left for dead. Mocked. Belittled. And he's saying, these people, these people who have made yourself, yourselves your enemy, these are the people I want you to sacrifice for on a grand level. Paul is saying, this is where I want you to go. And he's saying it because this, he says, is how we are going to reach the world for Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, I'm making this part of my model for effective evangelism. I'll ask you this. Was Paul pretty good at evangelism? Yeah. I got that impression that Paul kind of knew what he was doing. If you had to sum up, if you looked at things, what made Paul effective as an evangelist? He simplified everything. He simplified things, okay? He got it down to the basics, okay? What else? Very knowledgeable. He knew his stuff, didn't he? Yeah. He went. He went where he had to go to reach the lost. He, he didn't sit in church and go, I hope somebody shows up to hear me preach. And he didn't care what status of life someone was in. Nope. Reached anyone. He reached anyone. Absolutely did. That seems to follow the pattern of another guy. Who was that? That Jesus guy. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't fear man. He was not scared of anything. There was a boldness to him, yes. Uh, yeah, an interesting model, he would always go to the, the synagogue with the people who knew about God first, and knew about God's word first, start with them, and when they rejected it, he would then move to the, the Gentiles. Um, the Absolutely. Let me run these through you, because you hit on a number of these. Hey, back there, yes. Uh, his love for God. Oh, absolutely. He had a passion for God. He had no fear. And do you think it impacted people that this God he spoke about, he seemed to really, really think this was a great guy? Somewhere. He knew how to relate to people. Like when <coughs> he says the inscription is to an unknown God, and he's able to just pick up and know how to use what's there and relate to people at different status and different levels. Stan, brilliant at that, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Whatever the circumstance, and I'll find a way to make a connection. Yeah. I was gonna say that would be it. Yeah. You want to go somewhere, God may know, and he stayed. Yeah. yeah. That was. I, I've always been. That's one of my favorite verses. Uh, we choose our path of God directs our steps. And that means that I intended to go here, <laughs> and sometimes God's going to go, but once you're moving. Yeah, and Paul was unstoppable. Absolutely unstoppable. I, I look at these things, I, I put this up. First, Paul had the right message. Some of you said this, the knowledge. Paul knew what he was sharing. Yeah. I am tragically upset with how few Christians seem to have the basic understanding to share their own faith that know enough about their own gospel to be able to articulate it. It is really sad to see how bad we are at doing a basic thing. You should practice your testimony. If you are saved, you should be able to say how you got there. And the number of Christians that can't do that is really disturbing to me. I'm not saying we all have to be scholars, but we should know the message. We should be studying. 
let me give you just a little insight. Uh, my favorite thing in high school, having been raised in the Southern Baptist Church, I found that Christians were some of the dull-wittedest people I'd ever met. <laughs> that sounds cold, doesn't it? But I found I had a fairly quick wit, a fairly agile mind, and I found that I could embarrass Christians all the time. Get them into a debate, get them discuss things, and I could make them look like idiots, and I loved making them look like idiots in front of other people. And that's how I played the game. I was kind of turning myself against uh, a church I felt had been uh, less than honest and decent, and I did not care for their version of what God was supposed to be like. I ran into a Christian in my senior year that was the most annoying person I ever met. Because the guy wasn't necessarily brighter than I was, wasn't necessarily more knowledgeable. I read voraciously from a very young age just so I could have information to make people look bad. And this guy wouldn't stop. He would always say, here's the worst thing he would do. I don't know, but I'll get back to you. You know what that jerk would do? He would get back to me. He would go look into this. He would talk to people. He would read. He would study. He would come back. I'd go, now i got to come up with something else to embarrass you with. And the guy wouldn't stop. He annoyed me into the kingdom of God. <laughs> and you look at this because this was a guy who would find out what he needed to know and cared enough to put himself through the nonsense I put him through time and time again for one purpose. I'm going to share the gospel because this guy needs it. Whatever happened to him? I do know him still, and I have, we have keep touch on Facebook. Uh, but he grew up out here. He's now in Northern California working in a law firm. Oh. Uh, he still <laughs> looks things up and finds out what he needs to know. <laughs> and is probably still annoying. <laughs> but Paul was good at that. He would stay on target. And as you said, he found whatever information he needed to have to get you where he needed to be. The second reason, Paul, he had a compelling motive. Paul said that the love of Christ, remember, constrained him. I have to do this. He saw himself having the task that he had to complete. There was a passion in him about it. Third, Paul had a sense of his calling. In fact, you can see that back in chapter 9, I believe up in verse 16, a sense of his calling here, if I'm not mistaken. And yes. Yet, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach. He has this sense. God asked me to do this. If I say no, how is that going to go for me? There's a sense of that. This is my responsibility. This is the task I'm put into. Fourth, he was affected, and some of you said this, because it was bold. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. He goes, I know I've got the right message, and I'm going to preach it. There was a boldness. He wouldn't back this down for anybody. Matter of fact, his biggest thing was, if someone's going to threaten my life for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. gain. What have I got to lose? If I get to live and serve Christ, super. If you kill me, I get to go and be with him. There's no downside to this. It's he saw life. That's a pretty good approach to think. Sixth, you mentioned this. He had a plan. Paul had a plan, and his plan was simply this. Do you ever look at the cities he chose? They're difficult ones. They were difficult ones, but they also had something in common. Trade routes. Trade routes. Every last one of them was a central hub where people passed through. If you put a church here, and people, traders came through, slaves came through, whatever, and they heard the gospel, guess what they did? Took it with them. They took it with them. And Paul targeted that. And as you mentioned, he targeted a group in every city he went to first. And what group was that? Jews. 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 Two reasons. One, he was a Jew and he had a real passion for them. And two, here's the one group that if I can get them to see the gospel, do they have a background in Bible? Yes. And once you get them to see the truth, now you have a group already trained to talk about the truth of God. But Paul didn't just depend on himself. Here's the other one. Paul always depended on the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul had training in the Greek world, had training in the Jewish world. This is a guy that could have said, ah, I've got it nailed. But he always depended upon God to make things happen. But number seven is the one that we're going to look at here in our text. Paul actually cared. The lost actually mattered to him. It wasn't a matter of just the number of baptisms he could put up on the church postcard in the front of the church every Sunday. It was that people mattered to him, 
and you can see the manner of it. Looking at verse 19 here. Though I am free and I belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. This is the attitude he has. Now notice he says, I have rights and I understand that. I'm free, but I make myself, and what word does he choose here? Slave. A slave. Now, what does that tell you about the number of personal rights Paul is willing to give up? All of them. Everything. What rights does a slave have? Absolutely nothing. And Paul comes at this and says, I'm willing to, and I want you to understand. Okay, let's, let's put the big picture there. Remember, this whole thing is talking about what we said were gray area things. Gray area things are things that are neither good nor bad in and of themselves. So the debates we have, now some of you may be bothered, I wish Martin would get a haircut, and I hate that guy up there, it looks terrible, I understand why he won't look like a man his own age. And if yes, really bothering you, tell me after class, I'll get a haircut. I'm gonna send you to my wife to let you know that I'm not making this choice because she will not be happy, but I will do that if you want. <laughs> the issues we talked about, whether you can tr drink, have, you know, have a glass of wine with dinner, whether you can dance, whether you can do, whatever the things are, there's a series of gray areas, and he says these are always negotiable. Always negotiable. But understand this, he's not saying that the truth is negotiable. This is the distinction he's making. I can surrender anything you want in the gray areas where it doesn't really matter, but I will surrender nothing in the truth area where it does. Mm -hmm. This is the, you're gonna see this distinction, I think, as we get into this. And he does as he said in verse 20 to gain the, he's gonna gain the Jews, verse 21, the Gentiles, and verse 22, the catch-all category, the weak. I'm doing this to reach three groups. Now, why does he put that? Because isn't there just basically Jews and Gentiles? Why does, what's the weak? Why does he throw that in? <laughs> what? Yes? <laughs> the French. <laughs> okay. History, student, history joke, the French. Okay. Well, the French. There you go. We could go through the French jokes. I remember from World War II. There's a whole bunch of them, but we won't go there. Because anyway, there's some people that couldn't even um, categorize himself as either Gentile or Jew. There, you know, you kind of had he, he was all inclusive, and that's his way of doing it. Just make sure he's kind of covering everybody. I think you're really onto something here. There were the Jews. They were set on their faith. There were some Gentiles that were rigidly following their gods and so forth. But most people fall into a different category. You know what that category is? Here. What's it? Don't oh. care. Don't care. There's all over the place. Or, or they could be just unknowing. They're illiterate. They can be unknowing, but most of them are just, we're all over the place. We're, I don't know if you've been following this gender thing. There's a, there's a couple of prominent people, uh, the daughter of uh, the ex-mayor, ex-governor of New York, and a, a singer that are talking about their gender thing. Their gender has changed now several times. Now, everybody, we all, we can now choose our gender. Well, they've chosen different ones, different times, different places which tells you that this whole idea of starting children on gender affirming therapy at age 12 doesn't make a whole lot of sense if adults aren't sure yet which one of the alphabet soup they want to follow. But the weak are what most people are. Whatever hits you at the moment. Whatever hits you, you know, I'll follow this God, I'll follow that God, I'll do this, I'll do that, we're all over the place. So, whichever, way the wind blows. whichever way the wind blows, the weak. And that's where most people live their lives. And he's saying that's the biggest group probably the ones that have no idea what they think at any given moment. It says, I'm gonna to try to reach all three of these. Now, in doing that, Paul is gonna do something, and I want you to understand this as well. As we said, these areas that are negotiable are the gray areas that are neither good nor bad of themselves, not the basics of truth. And here, here's another aspect to that that I, I want you to understand as we come into this, that Paul, how to word this. I should have written this down and been a little class. We talk about gray areas. When we talk about things that are negotiable. <clears throat> Paul also wants you to understand clearly here that the things that he's negotiating, that these gray areas, 
he does not want you to start to think that he's affirming that the rule you're making is a good rule. Yeah, do you follow me on this? I, I'm gonna, you, it bothers you, I'm gonna get that haircut, Wendy, I know it bothers you, but I, I, <laughs> yeah, there you are. <laughs> this, this girl's sharp. But here we go with this thing. In doing that, and I'm willing to concede that to make a person more comfortable. The one thing I'm not going to do is to affirm to you that that's a rule that really exists that God says makes you better. I'm not going to accept that because I have this and he has that, that this is the more spiritual guy in any way. <laughs> so understand this. When you make concessions, you need to make it plain, hey, this is not what God actually teaches. I'm not going to let you add to Scripture. I'm not going to let you add new rules that really are not what God said. But I want you to know that because I care about you, I'm willing to concede this point. I'm willing to do that to help you deal with that. If you come from a Jewish background, you know, you come over for a barbecue, we will not have pulled pork sandwiches, okay? <laughs> I will do that. I can have separate cooking instruments for the different types of food. I, I'll do whatever it takes to make you comfortable. But I'm not going to tell you that that teaching is what makes you a better Christian. Yeah. Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. That's important. Mm -hmm. That distinction is important. I don't want to make them think that these rules <clears throat> really do matter. I want them to know that they really matter. And that's a big difference in what Paul is after here. Because Paul makes it very plain that he doesn't push down too far. The world wants us to change our doctrine. We're willing to change our conduct. And those are two very different things. Uh, the world is really pushing hard at that. Right now. And I've given you these examples before, but I, I, I don't like to whack political, but I have to say I'm very disturbed by how much our current White House is pushing things at us yes. and telling us what we should believe and what we do believe as Christians. So I told you the president made the comment after Roe v. Wade that the Roe v. Wade decision was consistent with every religion, including Christianity. No, it wasn't. We have never questioned when life begins. That has not been something that scripturally we've ever struggled with. Pete Buttigieg, our transportation secretary, boldly proclaimed that if anybody really looks at the Bible and understands it, they know that there's nothing in there against gay marriage or gay relationships and homosexuality. It's not in the text. Get away from him. <laughs> and I, I, frankly, I'll say this. I don't think either one of them has opened the book enough to know what they're talking about. Get back to fixing the roads and the bridges and leave this to somebody who read the text. That's what I'm concerned with. Do your job, and let's look at what God actually said. You had your hand up, yes. Um, I just, just about those things, yeah. it seems like they understand because of the, the majority of the mass of people, you know, are easily swayed. I think, it, you know, they just say those things because people will believe them. That's sad. You say it long enough, and you say it from a position of authority, and somehow or other, well, what does being transportation secretary have to do with giving theological lessons to America at large? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, this is this is not your territory. He's talking about the road to heaven. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, it may be a road, but it's not to heaven. But anyway, yes. I think it's the Mike mentioned the gray areas too. That's kind of what Paul is dealing with here. Um, as opposed to those black and white issues, because I've, I've heard some people, you know, kind of use the illustration of when you're becoming like whatever, and you mentioned conduct, you know, oh, well, I'm gonna, you know, witness to prostitutes, so I'm gonna go and, you know, hang out with prostitutes and, and you know, interact with them. And it's like, well, wait a minute, that, no, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> wait a minute, yes. You know, and that's clearly a, a a black issue now, in a sense. Black you know, and white now, yes. It's a, it's a black and white issue. It's, it's not a, a gray issue, you know. And so the conduct is within the, uh, the gray issue area of something that's not right or wrong, but I'm going to adjust my conduct to meet the needs of a particular group. Yes. And again, that comes down to, like, Paul figuring out how to reach the Athenians by using the segue about all their gods. It, it's finding the language, finding the relatable point that, point that can bring them in and get them to talk about what we need to. Yes, sir? Uh, Romans uh, 
First chapter 27. Likewise, also, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their, their error, which was due. <laughs> but clearly you're misreading that. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> I, there's a clarity to this. Did you have your there's a clarity to this, but I want you to understand and see that Paul is bringing. Let's start just going through this verse by verse real rapidly just to see the sense of it here. In verse 20, to the Jews I become like a Jew. Now, what does he mean? How do I become like a Jew? What, what would be in view here with the gray areas? Cultural laws. Circumcision. Cultural laws. Cultural laws. Even circumcision. Now, did Paul even go that far with that kind of thing? He was already, we already circumcised. Yeah, but there was a young man Paul took, Paul took along with him, a young man named Timothy. And Timothy had a Gentile father and a Jewish mother, and he was not circumcised. And Paul says, I need you on my team. And you know what he had Timothy do? He got him circumcised. You're thinking, why did Paul do that? So he could walk faster. I doubt that was the case. Understand, where did we say Paul always began his ministry in a new city? He went to the synagogues. Where would Timothy not be able to go as an uncircumcised Gentile man? How would they know? Okay, they'll ask. <laughs> Let me tell you right now, they will ask. And unless you're willing to lie about it, they will ask because they want to know if you're really Jewish. And they want this is a big deal to them. And Paul wanted to have an honesty in saying that. So he he had that issue. We run through these kinds of things. There was a willingness to deal with that. This all came back, remember the Jerusalem Council, that whole thing, when they said the Gentiles are being saved, what are we going to do? And the Jews are going, well, the first thing they have to do is start acting like Jews, and then they can get saved. And remember, there were four things the Jerusalem Council sent out. They said, here's it. You're not, you're not going to impose on the Gentiles the idea they have to become Jewish. We're not going to tell them that their salvation isn't real, because it is. But they made four suggestions of things that would help if they were going to be able to witness to unbelieving Jews. Remember the four things were? Acts 15, if you want to look it up. Okay, avoid idols. Now, did the Jews have a real thing about idols? Boy, did they. The, you did. Rome had to coin different money in Israel than any place else in the kingdom. You know why? An image on it. it had an image on it, and they saw that as a graven image, and you couldn't, that they would not allow the Romans to put those coins. There had to be special money in Israel. So they're saying this, if you want to reach the Jews, it is probably a good idea to avoid those old idols. Maybe this whole idea of not eating meat sacrificed to idols, buying it from the yes. temple is a good idea if you want the Jews to listen to you. What was the next one? Stains of sexual immorality. Now, is that just good, solid advice? Yes. Is there anything more debilitating, more addictive than that problem in our culture today? I'll give you this example. I, I don't know, we just had a recent announcement about a new disease that is considered a public health emergency in our country. Monkey pox. Monkey pox. Now we just spent two years where we shut down the whole world over a virus. That virus we said was so deadly that you are not gonna be allowed to go to your business. You're not gonna be allowed to go to your job. You're not gonna be allowed to send your children to school. You're gonna to have to wear a mask. You can't get any closer to six feet to each other. And if you do not take the vaccine, we're gonna make you feel like the worst person on the planet. We're gonna dismiss you. And understand, I am not anti-vaccine. I am anti-stigma and I am anti the idea that they mandated these things. And we went through this. Now. That was a public health emergency, and those things we demanded you change in your behavior to stop the spread of that disease. What are we demanding now to stop monkeypox? Because 98% of monkeypox is happens between homosexual men. Mm -hmm. And the other 2%, almost exclusively, of people who have contact with homosexual men who have done these things. What are we doing? What are we restricting in terms of conduct? As a matter of fact, have you heard the reason why? The World Health Organization and our own Attorney General Office has said, here's why we will not do that. We don't want to stigmatize anybody. Oh my goodness. Do you understand this? We know how to stop the spread of this. We know, and we will not even suggest a change in behavior. Why? We don't want anybody's feelings to get hurt. 
Well, not those people anyway. Right. <laughs> and it's not even those people. Let's just sexuality is the one freedom this country says cannot be curtailed in any way. I don't know if you've noticed that. Freedom of speech, we don't really care. We can curtail that. Freedom of religion, we could certainly curtail that. But freedom of sexuality is the one freedom that is inviolate in our culture right now because it is an addictive reality. So when Paul said, when they said in the Jerusalem Council, here's one you probably ought to avoid, that's probably good advice. Probably makes a little bit of sense. And then they had two others, strangled, strangled and blood. The Jews always cut an animal and bled it out before they would prepare it. Some of the other guys would strangle because in Gentile culture, often blood was a table drink. Yeah. A table drink. Fresh animal blood was a table drink. And that's probably not the best place to get a Jew to hang out with you to share the gospel. So these were all things they said. If you're going to reach the Jewish community, probably a good idea to do that. So Paul goes, to be with the Jews, I'll become like a Jew. And he's probably pretty good at it, considering his background. And he's talking to those under the law, I become like one under the law. So I'll do all the dietary laws. I'll do the customs. I'll follow those things. Those are fine. So as to win those under the law. Now, in verse 21, those not under the law, I become like one not having the law. And then he puts a disclaimer. What does he say there? Though not without God. Though not without God. Well, wait a minute, Paul. You're saying we're not under the law, but we are. Which is it? <coughs> okay, here's the distinction. All these things are the gray area distinctives of ceremonial law, but what has never changed? God's moral law. That's the one thing that is not going to be altered. I'll eat what you want me to eat, but I will not change the moral law to, to suit you. I can't do that. I've actually had Christians hit me on this one. I've been called a heretic because I said that God's law still exists and still is important to Christians. And they say, no, we are not under the law. How dare you say that's heretical? To say God's moral law has never changed. It is not there for salvation. It is there to show you why you need to be saved. Don't get me wrong on that. I am not under the law in terms of its penalty, but I am under the law in terms of its requirements of this is the pattern of life I'm supposed to live. I'm not doing it to earn salvation. I'm doing it to show you what salvation looks like. And that is the distinction. Moral law is still there. And understand, the world very much wants to shift moral law. That is the big distinction between us and them. They are constantly pushing that envelope for moral law. Now, here's one that uh, was sent to me this past week that I thought was really disturbing. A uh, Pennsylvania official who is involved with counseling sex offenders has coined a new term for pedophiles. It is a minor attracted person. Okay? Now, I want you to understand something. Do I believe that God can take any sin you've committed, any crime in your past, and turn your life around? Do I believe God forgives that? And Absolutely. That's not what this woman's talking about. This person is saying, we're going to normalize this. We're going to, we want to, she makes it that we need to remove the stigma and the negativity attached to this. No, we don't. How do those minors feel about that? That's right. Yes. There needs to be a stigma attacked to pe attached to people who are continuing to commit that crime. But this is what the world wants. We have to change everything to normalize sin. To normalize what is going on. And Paul says, that I can't do. We have to hold on to a standard that makes sense. Let's jam on through this. I know a couple of you have to leave here pretty soon. So those not having the law become like that not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law to the weak again, the weak, I be become weak. I'll, I'll, I'll sit down and talk to you about this. I'll make you understand how you see and the view of the world. I will make a connection with you. But he's not saying I'm become a vacillating person that doesn't know what they believe. I have become all things to all men so that by possible means I might save some. And I love this word here. What? Some. some. What does that tell you? Not most. Not, not even most. Mm -hmm. That all this effort, Paul is saying, I'll, if it gets me one saved soul, it's worth the effort. 
If one person will sit down and hear this, it's worth the effort. But I'm not promising you it's going to have a massive explosion and rewrite the history of the world. It might, but it might not. We all do this all for the sake of, and there it is, the gospel. What does that mean? That means that the one thing that cannot change is what you're preaching. The conduct can, but the message can't. And then he gives us an example. We'll finish with this. What is it going to take to live like that? How can you get yourself to be willing to give up rights and live in that manner? Discipline. Discipline. What is the most lacking thing you're seeing in the coming generations? I've talked to a number of employers around that talk about this. They're having a really difficult time hiring someone that will put in a day's work. Right. And here's Paul saying giving up your rights is going to be an effort. And what examples does he give of this? What is the one thing we can almost all associate to and relate to? He gives two examples from sports. It's amazing to me that in our culture at large, we don't want to work to get anything, but somehow or other for getting the glory of putting a ball through a hoop or hitting one deep in the field, people will just drive themselves to the brink to make this. You know Tom Brady, throwing the ball at 45 years of age? He spends millions of dollars a year for specialized trainers, dietitians to keep him in shape to do that. I don't know if there's ever been anyone who's worked harder to stay in a sport as long as he has. This is his world. And all he's doing is throwing a pigskin to a guy. Come on. But for that, we'll do this. And he gives two examples. The runner. Any of you ever done distance running or any kind of sprinting? Is there a little effort involved in doing that? To stay in shape? Did you just sort of hang out and not do anything until the day before the race? Maybe I had to get in shape. A little late then, buddy. A little late. You push yourself. Getting through, I love that, I hit the wall. To push yourself through the pain to do that. There, there's an effort involved in being good at that. And the second one is my one I really like, the boxer. Because I'm going to get into the ring, and here's his fate. And I think this makes infinite sense. If any of you have ever known anything about boxing, have your background, let me tell you something. This is a key to winning. You have to hit the other guy. <laughs> and this is Paul going, if I'm going to get in the ring, I'm going to hit somebody. I'm not going to go out there like a shadow boxer, you know, doing the fancy moves and look at this hand, his footwork. That guy's a blur on the canvas. Who cares? If you're going to win, you're going to hit somebody. But let me tell you something else about discipline. If you get close enough to hit him, guess what? He can hit you. Yeah, I know. Who would have thought? Paul puts these two examples in to say if people will do it for a sports thing, for something temporary, you know what the, the winning thing, it wasn't a gold medal in this. You know what the winners got? Yeah. A, wreath. a little laurel wreath. You know how long those things lasted? <laughs> On a hot day, maybe not even until the end of the games, okay? You put all of that effort, you sacrifice months, years of your life for a shot at winning that for something you'll have for a few days. And Paul is saying, how much effort will you put into something that has eternal consequences? Does this drive you at all? Does this matter to you at all to put yourself out of your comfort zone just a little? And that's his challenge. And again, the challenge he's saying, I'm, I'm challenging you to do this for people that will probably hate you. For people who will treat you badly for doing it. Yes, Susie? It's because it's hard work. It is. And people don't like hard work. Actually, I do, and I know it's, it's, it's a dying thing, and I, I've always wondered because there's, there's a real sense of accomplishment after you're wiping the sweat off mm -hmm. and a real hard job has been done. Yeah. And I wish, the current because there's, there's a real satisfaction to that moment mm -hmm. of having sweated to make something work out mm -hmm. and get it done. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's a, it's a high like no other I've ever experienced to have that happen. Yes? But it's, um, sport was not something that you're pursuing the sports is not his concern. You're pursuing God is. And therefore, he's going to work that much harder against you. And if you succumb to that, you, I mean, you're more likely to succumb to that than you are to not training for a fire. And those that will do something. I found it interesting. My, my wife and I just watched uh, the movie in the life of Kurt Warner, who uh, the quarterback that... Uh, 
overcame was called American Underdog. And I found it interesting because one of the key elements when he won his first Super Bowl, anybody watch Kurt yeah. Warren's for him? What movie he said? Yeah. What he said? Thank you, Jesus. And they said, Who do you want to thank? I want to thank my Lord and Savior for this. It is interesting that in this movie, where the key element that drove this thing with the man's faith, that they underplayed that through the whole film. Yeah. And they played it very much the, the effort he went through physically. The effort he went through mentally to prepare himself to finally get his shot at the, at the big leagues and make it. But the thing that really transformed him, the woman he met who had faith that led him to Jesus Christ, that was underplayed through the whole thing. Because that's something Satan doesn't want you seeing. That this is the drive that really gave the man greatness in his life. Yeah, the physical effort was something, but the mental and the spiritual effort was the biggest thing. But they wouldn't talk about that. Underplayed it. Yeah, the devil doesn't care if you're good at sports. He's probably a fan. Probably the Vikings. Who knows? <laughs> we'll close this. Questions, comments as we close out. Anything I did?